All right. So what's up? I guess I've just been thinking about just just to clarify, my general thinking on this is um, one is that I'm not a Calvinist, right? <laughs> I personally don't think predestination is moral or or good. I, I'm I'm not a Calvinist either. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm just outlining my uh, my current my current thinking of the matter, just just so I can speak through it. Um. And and I guess my problem is that. It doesn't make any sense to me that what, what we know is that individuals in the world will inevitably never come in contact with the teachings of Christ. And if we accept that not coming in contact with the teachings of Christ and never getting saved damns someone, then we are effectively saying that Christ or that that God has simply decided these people. Um, will never be saved. Your your problem. Or, hold or, up. Yeah. Well, your problem here is that you've accepted a false premise. Like I said, Paul states in no uncertain terms that if the word hasn't reached someone, that they'd be judged by natural law. Belief in God need not apply in that scenario. So, like accepting accepting right. this idea that never accepting Christ or not even hearing the word leads to internal damnation. That's not a biblical principle. That's not something that the Bible actually says is true. No, I, was, I was reading that, and um, you know, there, there's and you get the famous uh, narrow gate quote, right? Where it's like, the road to damnation is wide, but only a few will get to the narrow gate, right? And it's right. like, I don't know. It's hard for me to to figure out how to interpret things. Well, see, I don't. I don't really like verses like that on a personal level. Um, not for any... I'll word it like this. It's not clear exactly what Matthew is stating, and that verse has historically been used for theological exclusionism. So, for instance, I'm a Messianic Jew, right? There aren't a lot of Messianic what? Jews. I could easily just guilt trip anybody who is even remotely susceptible to believing what I have to say, to be like, well, you know, that gate is narrow, and uh, there aren't as many Messianic Jews as I think there should be because that gate is narrow. Like, like you know, so what I tell people is, is, is that perhaps it, your time is best spent not worrying about statements in the Bible that are vague to the point in which they can be applied to anything and anything. I, mean, I guess it just it it, it 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 just feels like it feels a little more explicit than the other of those vague quotes that do are that are kind of bullshit and used to justify stupid things like like the for wide is the gate and broad is the road leads to destruction and it's like and there's um like like I'm not sure what else that could refer to in that case. I mean, I don't. I don't know what it refers to. Like, you know... <laughs> like, like, like I said, I it's... People would argue that it refers to... Go on. Like, damnation, I guess. And pe I guess people people generally assume that since the other gate is uh, life, eternal life, I think people assume that it means something about damnation and uh, being saved. Or it could be yet another metaphor for something unclear. You know, Ma Matthew doesn't go into detail what he means by that. And like, you know, perhaps he means that it can be narrow. Like, you know, for a lot of people, it will be narrow. Right. But like, you know, that doesn't guarantee the idea that like, you know, in, in, you know this is how Jehovah's Witness operate. operate. Like, you know, they operate with like a, an idea that only very few people are actually saved. It's like, you know, nowhere in the New Testament is that sentiment actually echoed anywhere. It has to be read into the text. Right. I guess, because I, I'm thinking of the afterlife, right? Because it's, 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 it's an important part of, um, <laughs> it's an important part of theology. I guess... Maybe I, I really shouldn't be making such claims or or thinking about the afterlife so much. I, I, you're completely right about that, but it's it's hard not to, I guess. 
it, it, it just feels like one of those those things that'll make or break how I how I see my faith. I guess if that makes any sense. Well, a lot like... of a lot of Jewish philosophy revolves around the doing, and in Jewish philosophy, there's a sort of idea that if you can't stop something, you're best off not worrying about it. Now that can be inherently self-defeating to some point, I'll readily admit that. But in the case of things such as the afterlife, where it's literally out of anyone's control, um, I think that that philosophy and that thinking is spot on. You know, there are people who waste their entire sort of corner of what they focus on in theology about, you know, what happens to you when you die. But when you take those people and you, like, you know, put them through the ringer, it's always going to be the exact same thing. We don't know. No one knows. Right. And it's mostly just a difference in, like, what we think is probably best to do before you die. <laughs> so you make sure, make sure that you get into the kingdom and stuff like that, right? Right. Like, you know, all that time you could be... All that time that these people have spent stay, saying, this person's going to hell, this person's going to hell, could have been time spent actually saving people by spreading good ideas and a good message. You know, shaming people into how you believe never works, ever. You know, the 2016 election is a good example of this. Yeah. I, I, I guess... The issue is then I, I kind of understand the the idea behind it. Like let's let's take something like sexual immor immorality in the Bible, right? That that whole definition has that whole fucking clusterfuck behind it. <laughs> How people don't define it, and a lot of people think it's very important to try to get rid of everything, right? So they might go, well, it's it's like a really bad sin for you to have this kind of lust, so we should try to, try to prevent it, in society. Because it could prevent someone from getting to, like, heaven. And I, and I understand the sentiment behind wanting to argue through that, I guess. Like, if we if we can't make claims about what we ought to do, then it, it does feel like... So, do, so like, I, I don't know. I, I, think, I think I understand why people want to make claims on what people ought to do, I guess. Yeah, um... But everyone wants to be a teacher. A few people want to be a learner. That's, that's how I view it. Uh, a lot of people are very sure that they know what the truth is. Um, and that they know how to interpret the Bible. Uh, my take on that is, is that interpreting the Bible takes so much more that quite literally unless you've devoted a huge swath of your life to it there's likely an aspect of the text that you're never going to understand you know there, there's the middle eastern context and background to a number of things and paul makes references to the science of his time so you've got to like uh, understand how science was back in like 3 AD and if you don't know anything of that you're half the stuff he says isn't even relevant uh there's What's an example of that of uh, what paul referencing the uh science of his time or yeah because i remember not really understanding paul, <laughs> paul that much to be honest. <laughs> um it's in one of his letters i'm not i'm not quite sure which one just because it's like it's 12 a.m for me um I'll have to find it, and once again, I'll put it down in the, the chat once I find it, but um, it's in one of his letters where he's referring to a sort of bizarre reason why women should cover up, and the context behind that was that it, it was believed that hair was indicative of fertility, like a man like stored his seed in his hair or some crap like that. I... <laughs> I I I I have to reread the article again. Um, let me let me see if I can't find it. Is that also why like um, Samson getting his haircut is such a big deal? Because 
No. Is it masculinity or no. something? Is it the same thing? No. No, Samson. Oh. Well, well, I know, but like, did it like kind of come out of the same impulse? I guess of like cultural. Assault? No, that's literally like that. That's like a thousand years before that even was a thing. Dang. You see, and that's just it. The timeline of the Bible is also completely messed up. You know, the the oldest figure in the Bible, you know, if if you follow like a genuine Bible timeline, is like. Abraham in the 1800s BC. And it goes all the way up to 33 AD, leading up to the death of Rabbi Yeshua Hanosri. So there's two, there's almost 2,000 years of cultural, linguistical, theological development there. And again, if you're if you're ignorant on any of it, you're not going to be able to read the Bible correctly. I see. By the way, where can I find um, like a good timeline for everything? Because, like, uh, one that's, like, more uh, unbiased, I guess, if it makes any sense. Of how everything went. So the area, I think, is 1 Corinthians 11.34. Doth that not teach uh, even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, is it a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. Right. So, like, you know, what, what Paul is suggesting here, like, you know, a man with long hair, it's a shame. Why? Because it, it means that he's not, it's not, use, he's not using his nature. Um, a lot the first Corinthians 11 confuses a lot of people because of that. Right. Is, is that also, does that have anything to do with fucking Islam's thing about, no, that's sexual morality. I, I don't know that much about fucking the Quran, to be honest. Uh, mo what I tell people is, is that forget the Quran. Um, Jews will insist that Muslims and Jews have more in common with each other. And while that's true, you know, culturally speaking, the reality of it is, is, is that the New Testament has more Jewish things in it than the Quran. And the Quran completely re recontextualizes what's in the Bible for its own needs. You know, it makes the same mistake because Muhammad, again, he, he didn't, he wasn't a scholar. He didn't know any of these things. Now, of course, Muslims are going to be like, well, he was a prophet, but that's, that's a belief. So right. not, not much to be done there. If you believe Muhammad's a prophet, uh, I, then nothing he about? says can be debunked on a fundamental level, which, like, you know, is pretty much all that need be said there. What do you think about the sort of orthodox claim that we can't interpret the Bible without their holy tradition? Without the like, orthodox holy tradition? It's nonsense. Yeah, like, like, it's nonsense. Like, it's nonsense. Look, tradition, tradition has its place, Okay. Tradition absolutely has its has its place. I'm not knocking that. But any one group claiming to have the correct tradition, I Good luck proving that one. You know, I would like to see proof of that. Cuz we we should see that say in the text. For instance, there are um if you ever look at him, there's a YouTube channel called Inspiring Philosophy, and he's made a series of videos on supposed contradictions. And he points out multiple times in the New Testament where there is very clear, representable practice of the Mishnah in the New Testament. Now, the Mishnah is the Jewish tradition as to how to follow the law. So if the Orthodox tradition were, quote, true, and that the Bible can't be interpreted without the Orthodox tradition, we should see echoes of that somewhere in the canonical text. But we don't. It, we see it in a way that requires it to be, once again, read into the text and not out of the text. Right. So <laughs> all, all, all these groups claiming to have traditional supremacy well our tradition's the truest tradition and it comes out of the first church it's all a bunch of crap it's a bunch of crap 
it's totally fine if if you want to believe in it. I, I'm not gonna knock you for it. All, all communities need to have collective traditions in order for the communities to work, and my own group isn't any different from that. No group is different from that. But to say that your group has the right tradition, that's where it just. That's where it, t it turns against reality. Reality itself is not able to accommodate you on these things. Right. Do you... <laughs> this is a funny question. What do you think about the, the orthodox stance on demons? <laughs> I'm, I'm not particularly familiar with their stance on demons, but well, I, I, I'm, I, a, I I'm a Heizarian, a... so I'm not, you know, it's probably not that. Well, I think the general orthodox position is that I think it's like they think the demons are a lot more present than they are in many other denominations. It's like they generally think that demons uh, have a pretty big role to play in tempting people. More than the Catholics, probably. I'd say. I mean, I could see that. The thing is, is that you get a lot of these fake possessions nowadays, and so it's led a lot of Christians to not accept the idea of demons. But if you read the actual accounts of demonic possession that we have in the scriptures, demons are pretty intelligent creatures. You know, they don't just take over people's bodies, mow their lawns, brush their teeth, go to their jobs and do their work for them and then head to Sunday church and be like, oh, only the power of Jesus can save you now. Like, that that's not what demons do in the Bible. And it's ridiculous to think that that's what they would do in real life. So, I mean, I guess the Orthodox view could be correct. I mean, I've never spoken to a demon, to be fair. Who knows? Maybe they're all gone. Um, or maybe they've chosen to simply take a more silent position on things. It's not, it's not clear what the status of demons are in today's world. Yeah. What, what is your position of demons, by the way? Because my, per, because I feel like I, I personally am not that into the whole demon thing. I don't see enough evidence for it personally, at least in the modern world. So I in think. the, in Dr. Michael Heiser's corpus of literature, may he rest in peace. Um, he goes on to describe how the background literature in the Bible would lend itself to an interpretation that when a Nephilim died, their spiritual essence would persist and become a demon. Right. So a demon is essentially a dead giant. And from there they would wreak havoc, possess people's bodies, the, the typical shenanigans they're associated with. Right. Oh, oh actually, the, the Orthodox think demons are fallen angels. Yeah, no, this is, a, this is a common mistake people make. Fallen angels are angels that have rebelled against God. Demons are dead Nephilim. At least from the Heizarian view of things, and I... I, I, I mean, I can't summarize the entirety of four or five books. I, I believe it's four of four books here in this conversation. You're just going to have to take my word for it. Heiser makes a very compelling argument with the in, entirety of literature that he has on this. How do you spell Heiser? Uh, H. Give me a second. Da, 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 da. There's an entire channel here on the surfer. Whoops. H E I S E R. Dr. Michael S. Heiser. What do you think about using the Apocrypha to inform faith? Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm not anti Apocrypha. I mean the, the only reason why the Apocrypha is the Apocrypha is because we can't confirm who their authors are. And again, if you read the book of Enoch and then you read the New Testament, it's kind of difficult not to be of the impression that the book of Enoch unquestionably influenced what the New Testament authors believed. Um, there's even a quote in, I think, the book of Jude and somewhere else in the New Testament 
of the book of Enoch. So the New Testament authors very clearly thought that these books were important. Now, did they think that they were canon? That's kind of stretching it. I would say that the authors of the Bible and the authors of the New Testament thought of apocryphal literature the same way I use science uh, to sort of fluff out my theological worldview. That I genuinely believe in the two of them. I generally put weight on one or the other given what we're talking about. And so I think that it's an important piece of data that should be kept around when needed. But it's not necessary in order to you know, have some sort of uh, uh, entryway into heaven and, and it's certainly not inspired literature the book of Enoch for example does a really good job at explaining a lot of the background information mythology wise for the book of Genesis so right uh, so I'm not anti-apocryphal literature I will say that I stand in a minority opinion when it comes to that. Most Jews and Christians reject apocryphal literature, or, or at the very least, they don't care about it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say reject. In fact, uh, to Jews, this isn't even really a, a real category of literature. It's, it's, you know, the Torah, the Nevi'im, the Ketuvim, and beyond that is just extraneous literature it's all just extraneous literature so uh, I'm, I'm not against it i'm very much for reading apocryphal literature just so long as the people who i'm talking to understand that it's not canon it's not inspired literature like the rest is right and just just one last thing um my conversations with you really helped with thinking my thinking about I guess the context of the Bible, and I was wondering what resources would we, what resources would you recommend um, for someone trying to learn more about Jewish history and like Jewish tradition in order to get a better perspective on the Bible. I'm not gonna like convert or anything to Messianic Judaism. I just <laughs> I mean I just if, think it'd be really useful now. Um, unless you were Jewish, I wouldn't even encourage you to convert to Messianic Judaism. Um, the Christians are just fine where they are. Not non-Jews are just fine where they are. Now, if you're a non-Jew, there's absolutely no reason for you to be uh, joining the the Jewish body. Um, but that's probably a video for another time. As for resources, ooh, um, boy, is that going to be a little difficult to. Uh, to, to give, I guess you could probably start with Jewish history. Uh, there's a channel called Sam Aranau who does a pretty good job talking about Jewish history uh, all over the place. And here, there's a, there's a link to that. And of course, link in the description. Um... I guess the next resource that I would recommend is sepharia.org. Now, sepharia is a Jewish website that seeks to translate the vast majority of the entirety of Jewish literature, which is a lot, by the way. That's a lot of stuff. Um into English as well as linking to commentaries. So if you click on, let's say, you know, go down to Tanakh, Genesis, chapter 1, it'll give you the Hebrew and then it'll give you the English and you can click on each and every sentence and it'll give you commentary, Talmud, Midrash, Halacha, uh, yeah. everything, everything Jews have to say on the topic is at your fingertips. Whoa. Yeah. 
it's quite an invaluable resource, and I recommend it to anybody who wants to start taking reading the Bible seriously. Now, do I agree with everything Jews say? Obviously not, because I'm a, I'm a heretic Jew, okay? So obviously I don't agree with everything they have to say, but uh, I stand by my non-believing brethren when I say that this project is of high value, and so... Um, I absolutely recommend everyone should have this site bookmarked if, if they take Bible reading seriously. Right. Also, uh, as, as a Messianic Jew, I'm wondering, what exactly, how do you conceive of your role in the world, in like the, the larger sort of uh, cosmology and spiritual, like, world how do you conceive of that as a messianic specifically it's an interesting question <laughs> that's, that's a big ask so for clarity to, to the people who are gonna see this after the uh the conversation i, I am halakhically jewish and to jews that's important because that's the difference between whether or not you're actually a jew or if you're you know not not really jewish at least for the most part you know there are some groups that uh, have a different version of whether or not you're halakhically Jewish. Like, you know, for instance... You're not uh, a real Jew. Well, yeah. <laughs> and for instance, reform and messianics accept whether or not your father is Jewish while conservative and orthodox only accept Jewish should through the mother. Right. Um, so, you know, I am halakhically Jewish in accordance with both halakha and... Uh, all four primary branches of Judaism, not including Messianic in that one, by the way. That would be Orthodox, Conservative, Reform, and Humanist. Um, and, you know, God gave the Jewish people a job to do that I take very seriously. And that job is to be a nation of priests. So, <clears throat> at least when it comes to non-Jews, I try my hardest to help non-Jews understand, you know, the scripture, what God might want, why you should believe in a God, why God cares about you. You know, like, the typical things that a priest would do. Now, am I, do I personally think I'm perfect in that? I I'm probably not. And I'm probably wrong about a number of things. So I do my best. This is why I take what academia has to say very seriously. I take what prominent Jewish rabbis have to say very seriously. I take what prominent uh, Christian figures have to say very seriously. And it, you, you've been through it yourself. What I basically do is I give you all the information and you make your own decisions from there. Right. Um, when it comes to my interaction with Jewish people, it gets a little more complicated. Jewish people have a very unfortunate history with the figure of Rabbi Yeshua Hanusri. And many of them compulsorily hate him as a result. So I guess really my only goal with Jewish people is to just support them when I can, oppose them when it's necessary, mostly when they're attacking me, unprovoked. Um, and if they want to talk... The game comes up to you, start fucking beating the shit out of you, start fucking... Well, no, 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 so Messianic Jews have a... <laughs> Messianic Jews get a lot of uh, flack in the mainstream Jewish community. There's a lot of bigotry towards us. I'm not saying that it's completely unearned. The Messianic Jewish community in the past uh, did not behave the way it should have. Um, but it's resulted in a state of affairs where Messianic Jews are heavily, heavily ostracized to the point in which it is a blatant double standard. Uh, but again, that's, that's a video for another time. Um... And if, if any mainstream Jew simply wants to talk about Rabbi Yeshua, then I'm more, more than happy to do it. No. So, 
I guess you could say that I view myself as an intermediary for anyone and everyone who wants to learn. I see. Is, isn't there something about, um, like, I'm, I'm sorry, this is probably like really ignorant. I, I don't know that much about Jewish practice. About Jewish practice, practice which is about like healing the world or something like that. Right, so it's that's the notion of tikkun olam. Um, and it's the see. I'm gonna say this, and then someone's gonna be like, "Actually, dependent as to who you ask, it either has no grounding in Tanakh or it does." Well, two Jews, three opinions is the famous quote. Um, from what I can tell, it's, it's the idea of it started from a, from a, um, Kabbalic perspective and Kabbalah is a, a beast in on itself. Um, that is very difficult to describe, requires you to know Hebrew, the whole nine yards. But the notion is, is, is that... Now, let me let me Google it. I don't want to misquote this. I mean, I don't know what else to say other than that it is it is as it is literally translated. It's the notion about repairing the world and that it's rooted in Kabbalah as part of the releasing of divine light um which you know the concept of divine light is that like god created the world through tasum sim something from nothing and the action of doing that sort of broke god a little bit and released shards of light into the into the world and so certain mitzvot or certain actions certain events release this light back to god or Something along those lines. It's been a while since I've I've read Kabbalah. I've sort of put it to the side as I've as as I do with a lot of things that I study. So I I'd, I don't feel really comfortable going into deeper territory outside of that. But um, you know, Jews weekly pray the Alenu, and right. so you know the the Alenu makes a reference to the uh, notion of tikkun olam. It's like, you know, all all branches of Judaism, including Messianic Judaism, well, we, we believe in repairing the world. Now, do I think that the Kabbalah stuff is valid? Um, um, I, jury's still out on that one. Right. Last one. Um, really, really last question. <laughs> Specifically about the conception of the physical world as the fallen world. What do you think about that? I'm not familiar with this notion. Um, the physical world's not the fallen world. It's the only world. Well, 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 there's also like the heavenly world, right? No, there's the divine realm. Well, you know, I think it's healthier to think of these places as realms because it's possible for these places to intersect with each other. So, for instance, Eden before the fall existed about halfway in the earthly realm and halfway in the heavenly realm. It's the place where the divine and the earthly met. You know, and that's why being kicked out of the garden is so tragic that it is the closest than an earthly being could have ever gotten to heaven without dying. Right. Um, there are other realms in the Bible, like Sha'ol, and if you read the New Testament, there's Gehenom, there's uh, Abaddon, which is apparently a, uh, an endless pit. Now, go figure that one out. Well, I mean, Abaddon's also an angel. It, it's an angel, and he's from a realm called Abaddon. So it gets complicated. But, you know, the idea that this is, quote, the fallen realm sounds like a Gnostic idea to me. Gnostics were the ones who were like, earthly experience is hell. 
Uh, the only way out is to essentially die and uh, uh, right. I, be free I, I guess with a like, monad or. I guess what I'm trying to get at is I'm, I'm trying to wrap my I've been trying to wrap my head around the um, the way that the earthly life is conceived of in Christian faith, and that is I think a lot of people think of it as something that's like it's important, but it's also almost like not important in the face of God, I guess. Like, if you get what I mean, I don't know if that makes any sense at all. It's like, it's important to live it out right, but, like, it only matters because because of, you know, like, you're, you're, because of, like, how you interact with God through it. And it's like, what, what do you think of that? It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I kind of don't think that makes any sense. Um, you know, there is this idea that all humans are infected with, quote, original sin. Messianic Jews don't really believe in original sin. Um, we don't find it to be a, a necessary idea. I mean... I, yeah, I, I mean... The idea that this world is fallen when indeed this world will be what the world to come is built on. You know, it doesn't make any sense. This world is what has continuity with God's creation. It's, it's not, it's not fallen. It's broken and it needs to be repaired. Those, those are two different ideas and they certainly are the competing ideas. I, I mean, I, I'm not denying it. Christianity does act in essence that this is the fallen world. Um, but, you know, I, I guess I'm open to people convincing me that that's the case, but as far as I remember, there's not much biblical justification for that one. So is in your opinion, Christ the Redeemer more like, I guess, Christ the Repairer or something like that? Re Redeemer, Repairer... It's less about, like, redeeming pulling human beings from original sin and, like, freeing all the souls that were in hell because we, we were just always going to hell before well, that. Well, I mean, he, he certainly is an intermediary redeemer as well. You know, no no one in today's world can do the law 100%. I mean, and we, we don't maintain that you can be saved by committing to the entirety of the law, but in theory, if you can, I... It can't be done in today's world. No one sacrifices goats on the Temple Mount anymore. It's impossible, not with the Dome of the Rock being there, most certainly not. So, he is he is a Redeemer. He is the Redeemer. But, um... You know, you know he, he redeems us. And through redeeming us, the world is redeemed. It's not, it's not the world that's the problem, it's the people in it that are the problem. You know, if you, if you removed every human from Earth and moved them to Mars, Earth is not damned, like, you know, it, it doesn't, it's not a person, it's not a thing. So, like, the, the idea that it's the, it's the earthly realm that's the problem and not, like, you know, or, or like, that's been fundamentally poisoned and not the beings that exist in it. You know, I, I'd say that that's thoroughly detached from reality. Yeah, I, I guess I mean more like, um, the, like, I think people feel that original sin is about how the fact that all human beings, no matter what, are sort of tainted with... Um, yeah, and, and they, maintain that, they maintain that the animals fell with Adam, even though they didn't do anything. Which is like a ridiculous concept. This is why Judaism wholeheartedly rejected it. No, the Jewish sages write that babies don't go to anywhere bad, not because of some purgatory, uh, but because when we're born, we're born with the Torah on our hearts. And as we get older, we grow ignorant of it. You know, I, completely more plausible, in my opinion, for the whole baby thing and to owe it up to how Jews feel about this. Again, you know, if everyone's born with Torah in their hearts, then they're born sinless. No one, no one is born with sin. No, the word sin means to fall short of it. Does, and this, this is another misconception within the Christian world. The word sin does not mean to do evil. It means to fall short of. 
So it's not even a reflection of, like, to total evil. So, you know, original sin, the original falling short of, when you recontextualize it back into its actual context, it doesn't make any sense. Right. So, so like, if I sin by, say, I don't know, like, if I punch someone, <laughs> if I punch someone, then it's because I've fallen short, I've sinned because I've fallen short of what God thinks I'm capable of, of not punching someone. Yeah, yeah, you've, you've fallen short. Well, you've fallen short in the sight of God, you've fallen short in the sight of man, you've fallen short on a moral level. It's a pretty big sin to assault someone, you know? So you gotta make it better. Well, okay, well, well, what if he was really asking for, <laughs> what if he was really asking for it? Um, well, look, there's, yeah. there's, there's, there's complicated nuance in there. Like, you know, obviously, if you kill Hitler, like, that's not, that's not a bad thing. You know, so, there's, there's nuance to the idea of, of sinning. You know, is, is it sinful for a thief to steal bread if he's going to starve tomorrow, I don't think so. Right. I, I guess that also kind of runs into the larger question of utilitarianism and shit. It's like then people would be like, oh, you're just being utilitarian. Um, anyhow, that, that, that really was the last question. Thank you so much. That's, that's been really helpful. Not a problem. Anytime.